This is Tom Goki from Orthopedic Educational Services. Today I'd like to talk to you about rotator cuff impingement syndrome. Before we start talking about rotator cuff impingement syndrome, one of the things I should clarify is that from my clinical experience, things like rotator cuff tendonitis, bursitis, and impingement syndrome all fall into the same category and present with the same constellation of symptoms. So today for our discussions, we're going to lump all those together when we talk about rotator cuff impingement syndrome. Briefly to review the shoulder girdle anatomy, the rotator cuff tendons are made up of four muscles, the supraspinatus, the infraspinatus, the teres minor, and the subscapularis. They all attach into the proximal humerus and provide shoulder elevation and flexion. The glenoid labrum is a cartilaginous ring that attaches to the anterior glenoid uh, and helps to provide stability to the shoulder joint. The coracoclavicular ligament and the acromioclavicular ligaments all play an important part in shoulder stability. Patients will present with many signs and symptoms uh, and it's all based on their activity level and the mechanisms that they present with at the time of their injury. Patients can range from having a dull, achy pain that usually occurs from patients having problems that go on for weeks and months as opposed to a sharp pain that comes about from a sudden overhead motion or a fall or, a, or grabbing for an object suddenly. Patients will present usually with a painful arc in the 60 to 120 degrees range of motion in both flexion and abduction. Patients can present with sleep pain or night pain, overhead pain, and pain in the lateral upper arm or the deltoid region. Patients will not usually present with numbness in the small finger, but sometimes uh, with uh, persistent irritation and swelling in the rotator cuff region, the brachial plexus portion of the ulnar nerve can be irritated and cause patients to have that numbness. But keep in mind that patients can present with more than one problem at a time and while they may be presenting with rotator cuff impingement symptoms, they may also have a cervical disc that's subacute and uh, may not be noticeable for some time. So always keep that in mind in your physical assessment. Patients who have atrophy or weakness in the shoulder girdle also are susceptible to rotator cuff impingement problems. The pathology for rotator cuff impingement syndrome involves an inflammation of the rotator cuff tendon, especially at its insertion into the proximal humerus, inflammation of the subacromial bursa, and some compression against the acromion either from inflammation of the tendon and the bursa, or in many cases a, sub a subacromial spur develops and that decreases the space inside of the shoulder and all of those factors compress against the rotator cuff to cause inflammation and pain. Typically we see the spur development in repetitive overhead type activities, but also shoulder girdle weakness plays a part in this as well. Our physical examination has, multi, has many facets. Inspection, palpation, and range of motion of the shoulder are all important. Uh, the orthopedic tests will focus primarily on rotator cuff integrity as well as impingement, and these include a drop arm test, empty can, near Hawkins impingement tests, and a lift off test. Also pay attention to the crossover test as patients will typically present with AC joint pain as well. Diagnostic studies typically will uh, center around plain radiographs. Routinely, we will get an AP, an axillary, and a Y or outlet view. As you can see in the top picture with the red arrow, uh, patients who have a subacromial traction spur, uh, that spur will push down towards the top of the rotator cuff tendon. And as you can imagine, uh, that spur helps to decrease the space in the subacromial region. And then if you add in rotator cuff tendon inflammation and bursitis and some scarring in the coracoclavicular ligament, those all combine to cause impingement uh, and pressure against the rotator cuff tendon, which will present, uh, will cause the patient to present with some pain. Uh, patients who have a lot of arthritic change in the AC joint may have a spur that pushes down into the articular surface on top of the rotator cuff tendon, and this can contribute to pain as well. Uh, we see calcification in the rotator cuff tendon uh, on plain x-ray, 
And the other thing to keep in mind is if you notice that the humeral head is riding a little higher on top of the glenoid, this may be uh, the poor man's indication of having rotator cuff tear pathology. But again, this is not a universal sign. And if a rotator cuff tendon tear is uh, a prime concern in your evaluation, then the patient should most likely have an MRI scan to evaluate this further. Before we uh, select a treatment uh, option or a treatment plan for a patient, we need to take into consideration uh, many factors. Their age, whether or not they have chronic tobacco use, their occupation, their expected outcome and the expediency of that outcome, and any other medical factors that are associated with this. Things like diabetes, chronic steroid use, chronic tobacco use all have an effect on the quality of tendons and the blood supply to a tendon. Uh, and uh, sometimes this can raise uh, a clinician's uh, suspicion of rotator cuff tear when uh, these uh, patient factors are added in to their physical exam findings. Treatment options. Uh, obviously, modification of activity is a, an important thing to do, especially if the activity is what's contributing to a patient's pain or intensifying their pain. Uh, anti-inflammatory medications, either non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications or oral corticosteroids are frequently used to help reduce inflammation and pain. Uh, it's been my ex clinical experience that patients who participate in a structured exercise program or rehabilitation program uh, do much better than those patients that are left to their own uh, device. Uh, I will say that in very rare case, uh, cases I use a home exercise program uh, for patients, but those are in the ones that I know and trust will do the exercises, understand the exercises that have been demonstrated for them, and will be faithful about their use. Uh, another option is for patients to have a sub subacromial injection. This injection with corticosteroid helps to put the medication to the point of uh, the maximal inflammation and pain to help improve uh, their recovery. And lastly, for those patients who fail all treatment options or who have been diagnosed with a rotator cuff tear uh, as a result of chronic impingement problems uh, may uh, very well benefit from arthroscopic surgery. So as far as our subacromial injection is concerned, we have approaches from the anterior shoulder, the lateral shoulder, and the posterior shoulder. My experience has been that the posterior shoulder approach for subacromial injection is the easiest for clinicians to learn to do. It's the easiest on the patient, uh, and uh, it's very, um, very effective uh, to uh, provide a subacromial injection from this position. So typically, I'll have a patient sitting on a table uh, with their uh, shoulder exposed. Uh, I will find the posterior uh, spine of the acromion. I'll, I'll uh, mark that uh, with a, a target uh, mark, either with the end of a, a syringe uh, or a cap needle or uh, a ballpoint pen. Uh, and uh, uh, that will help me to uh, find my target. Uh, I'll prep the skin with some antiseptic soap. Uh, we use ethyl chloride in our uh, facility to help uh, deaden the skin prior to the uh, injection. And then we carry out this uh, subacromial injection uh, to, for the patient. There are a variety of corticosteroid uh, preparations, a variety of uh, uh, pain medications that are used to inject, uh, and I would just recommend that you know the uh, indications, contraindications, and the intended use for those medications uh, for uh, each one of your patients uh, and be uh, well, uh, well versed with that prior to uh, giving an injection. Uh, afterwards, uh, we give patients uh, instructions about home uh, ice to help cut down on uh, post-injection soreness. Typically, I will have these patients limit their physical activities, either exercise or work, for uh, at least three to five days. And uh, if they're in a structured rehabilitation program, I also have them limit that uh, activity for three to five days to allow the steroid medicine to work and to reduce inflammation. So in conclusion, uh, patients can present with a variety of symptoms and their onset can be gradual over days, weeks, or months, or it can be from a sudden uh, a mechanism or a sudden overhead type activity that uh, causes them to have pain and swelling in the rotator cuff uh, region. Uh, age and their activity level play a role in patients developing rotator cuff injuries. Uh, always be mindful of associated injuries that could impair uh, tissue healing or have a negative impact on the rotator cuff tendon. Uh, 
plane radiographs are always the most important studies to get initially and any advanced studies would be based upon your physical exam findings. Our treatment options vary from uh, oral anti-inflammatory medications, limitations of activities, a structured rehabilitation program, and subacromial injections. For any patient who has failed conservative care or who you think has uh, a rotator cuff tear or other pathology uh, in the shoulder and is not responding appropriately to conservative care, uh, the appropriate orthopedic referral is always, uh, always necessary. So for orthopedic educational services, I'm Tom Gokey. Have a great day.